and um, we will be getting started um, because we have a number of truly phenomenal speakers with us who are giving up their Friday evenings in um, Gaza City, Ramallah, Haifa, Tel Aviv, as well as here in Ohio. Um, so we have little time and much to learn. Uh, my name is Kayla Rothman Zecker, and I am a consultant with the Human Rights Center at the University of Dayton. I am Israeli American, and up until three years ago, I had been working for more than a decade on human rights related work in Israel Palestine. Through my work at the Human Rights Center at the University of Dayton, we placed uh, students from the University of Dayton at refugee aid organizations in Israel Palestine this summer. Although they were placed virtually, the recent wave of violence impacted the people with whom they work. When discussing this with the Human Rights Center, we realized that this was an opportunity to engage our students and wider community about this recent wave of horrific violence. And in order to understand this recent wave of violence through a human rights framework, we need to understand the system, a system that enacts daily violence that takes place mostly under the radar of international attention, but sets the stage for more acute violence, such as what we witnessed over these past weeks. This includes ethnic expulsions from East Jerusalem, home demolitions and restrictions on movements in the West Bank, laws that codify the second-class citizenship of Palestinians inside Israel, and the ongoing blockade and human rights crisis in the Gaza Strip. As a legal professional and a human rights practitioner, I am a deep believer that in order to understand any political situation or human rights crisis, we need to hear people's stories. That is the only way to actually understand, for example, how a law sanctioned by a Supreme Court actually affects an individual's lives and daily freedoms or lack thereof. So today we are trying to do two things in a short amount of time. We are providing some historical and legal context for the current situation for those who are new to this crisis and for those who have been reading about it for years and are still confused. We will also hear directly from perspectives on the ground without the intermediate nature of the New York Times or a Twitter feed. Um, we are extremely lucky to be joined by five truly phenomenal panelists. And although in the original invitation, we mentioned that Fadi Abu Shamala would like to be joining only through a pre-recorded video, we are extremely lucky and grateful that he's able to join us live today. Thank you, Fadi, for being with us. Um, first, I would like to just ask the panelists to briefly introduce yourself. Um, you will have more time to extensively do that later. Um, please say your name, um, where you are, where you are from, if that is relevant, and briefly what you do, if, that, if you'd like. I'm going to start with the last panelist first and make our way up to the first. So Emily, um, go ahead. Thanks, Kayla. Um, good evening or good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Emily Schaefer Omerman. I am an attorney based uh, in Tel Aviv, Jaffa, I'm actually coming to you from, from Jaffa right now. Um, I've been uh, practicing in the Israeli courts as a human rights lawyer for the past 15 years and have also more recently uh, explored the, the promising avenue of looking into foreign courts um, in order to uh, bring justice to Palestinian communities um, from Gaza to uh, inside Israel to the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And I look forward to telling you more about that uh, in a little bit. Thank you. Um, Amani. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Good. Okay, great. Um, my name is Amani Rohana. Um, I'm from a very, very small village uh, near Haifa, and currently I'm living in Haifa. Uh, I'm a Palestinian citizen of uh, Israel. Uh, I'm a student myself. I have a master's degree in international relations. I'm doing another master's in anthropology. I should be finishing now, hopefully, and starting a PhD soon. Um, I've worked with different groups, um, uh, Palestinians, Israelis, Americans in the past. I'm a group facilitator. Um, and I don't know if I can say I'm an academic, but I'm very happy to be here. So thank you, Kayla, for the invitation. Thank you, Amani. Um, Sam, to you. 
Hi, everyone. A lot of familiar faces and uh, great to meet the new people here. Um, I'm originally from Youngstown, Ohio. My family, uh, father, is, my father is from Albire, where I uh, speak to you from. I'm actually in the home he was born in. Uh, I, uh, my background is computer technology. I have an MBA from Tel Aviv and Northwestern Universities. And I'm a business consultant today, uh, but I spend about 30% of my time in writing and speaking and talking to different groups that come through. So I look forward to having a conversation today. Thank you, Sam. Um, Ellen. Uh, I'm Ellen Fleischman, and I am Professor Emerita uh, at University of Dayton, where I just retired. I um, spent four years living in the West Bank and Jerusalem, uh, either working as a teacher in a school in Ramallah or doing the research for my um, PhD dissertation, which was on the history of the Palestinian women's movement during the British mandate period. And I have taught um, the history of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict at UD for the past 23 odd years. Um, so I guess that's all I'll say. Thank you, Ellen. And Fadi, over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm Fadi Absamada uh, from Gaza City, uh, from Palestine. Uh, has a BA in English language. I'm also the Just Vision uh, Outreach Associate in uh, Gaza Strip and the Executive Director of the General Union of Cultural Centers, which is a union of 75 uh, cultural and art uh, centers in, uh, in Gaza and uh, West Bank. Finally, I'm a father of uh, three amazing kids mm -hmm. suffering in Gaza Strip. Thank you, Fadi. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm really, really grateful that you've taken your time to um, bring your experiences, your stories, and your knowledge to um, our community here in Dayton, Ohio. Um, Fadi, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> um, you recently wrote an, a, um, a piece that was published in Time Magazine. Um, with your permission, I'm going to read a quote from that piece. Um, Baba can fill bottles with water, stay up all night next to them, tuck a SpongeBob square pants blanket back around Adam as he kicks it off in his restless sleep, drive them to another city, which may very well be the next site of attack, try to disguise the shaking in his voice so that his kids don't realize how terrified he is as well. I can even implore parents in the US to call on their elected leaders to stop unconditionally funding the country who is dropping those missiles. But no matter how much I have learned through assault after assault on the Gaza Strip, the agonizing truth is laid bare in their pleading eyes. Baba cannot make this stop. I can do nothing to keep my children safe. Buddy, this piece was excruciating to read, especially as a parent to a daughter who is the same age as your Adam. Um, please tell us more. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Kyla, for... Uh inviting me, or as I prefer to say, Om Nahar. So in Gaza, we call people by, we started mail with Abu, so I am Abu Ali, since my first son, is, his name is Ali. And we usually call the people by Abu or, or Om. So thank you so much, Om Nahar, for inviting me. And of course, um, uh, much warm greetings to uh, uh, the students of uh, University of Dayton's Human Rights Centers and to my colleagues who are joining us in this uh, seminar. Um, uh, again, um, my name is Philip Shamara. I'm 37 years old. I spent all of my life in, uh, in Gaza Strip. I was so lucky to, uh, to go to uh, West Bank twice in all of my life. My wife didn't have this opportunity. So I was so lucky to be working in NGOs to hunt a permit that is issued by the uh, Israeli occupation. So they can allow me to uh, visit the next part of the of my country. Um, uh, I should start with 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 with, with general um, uh, talks. Then I will yeah, it talks about. Um, the specific points uh, regarding to uh, the other situation, I would say that um, 
starting from 2007, uh, uh, Israel uh, made uh, a hard disease uh, siege over uh, the uh, Gaza Strip. So uh, about 2 million people have been living in, uh, in a tight Israeli blockade since, again, 2007. They have been subject to uh, um, a brutal uh, military assaults uh, since that time. So in the context of the Israeli, as they call it, um, uh, mowing uh, the lawn. So um, military attacks and bombardment, which uh, indiscriminately kill civilians and cause massive uh, levels of damage to uh, civilians uh, infrastructure in, uh, uh, in Gaza Strip. Um, um, and quickly, um, um, uh, quick uh, statistics, 80% of the uh, Palestinians depend on the international aid. And 95 of the uh, Palestinian Gaza Strip, I'm talking about the people on, in Gaza Strip, uh, uh, have lack direct to uh, clean water. 70% uh, of the uh, Palestinian youth are unemployed, so they cannot have, there is no job for them. It's not about they don't have a job. Uh, they didn't work, look for a job, but they, they did not have opportunities. It's, it's regarding to the, the poverty line, which is also 85 of the Palestinian and Gaza Strip are living under uh, uh, poverty line. In addition to um, a very hard um, uh, circumstances that imposed by the um, Israeli uh, occupation, uh, unfortunately, um, Israel controlled Gaza Strip from um, three parts, uh, three, um, um, I mean, uh, locations. <clears throat> From the east and the north and the, uh, and the west, there is the Mediterranean uh, Sea, which is also the Israeli Navy is controlling it. That lead to um, controlling also the imported uh, goods. So the Palestinians themselves in Gaza Strip have not the capacity to uh, import goods out of from Gaza Strip without the permission of uh, which is issued by the. Israeli occupation. That's also, yeah, and I want to give you um, um, the, a simple, uh, a very simple example. I mean, we, we don't have 10 years to talk about the uh, obstacles that the Israeli occupation are, is imposing to the Gazan people. But I will give you a, a very quick uh, example and I will explain how it would affect the other aspects of the, the life in Gaza. So, so um, uh, for more than two weeks now, uh, the Israeli population are not allowing the, uh, the Gazan people to import fuel. So someone will think that it's it's easy to, to don't have fuel. So um, if you don't have fuel, then you can walk to the street in the street to, to go to, to your work. But it's not like that. So it's um, don't, doesn't have um, fuel that that number one didn't give the, uh, the Palestinian Gaza the electricity, which <clears throat> I mean the, 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 the electricity generator, the main electricity generator is, is, is generated, generating by um, the fuel. Um, so in Gaza still now we have, uh, now actually it's better. So we have three hours daily now, electricity in the one day. Uh, in the past we had, um, during the escalation, we had one hour, 90 minutes, not more than that. Before, before the, the escalation itself, we used to have around six to eight hours to have electricity at our, at our homes. <clears throat> Sorry. So also this issue, this problem lead again to, to not have a normal water. I'm not talking about the, the clean water because the Palestinian Gaza do not have clean water because it is also another story because the settlements that were in, in Gaza Strip, so the Israeli stole all of the, the clean water in, in Gaza before they, 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 uh, they leave it. So I'm talking about the normal water, so you can have shower, for example. So there's water bump, it's, which is generated by the electricity. So without electricity, we, we will not, I mean, if we don't have uh, fuel, Number one, we will not have electricity. Number two, we will not have uh, 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 water. And also, the hospital itself is, is it's, it's, it needs uh, electricity. The, the surgical uh, uh, room, uh, operation room, it needs also. I mean, um, if you just imagine, if if, if only um, do not have fuel when the Israeli are not allowing us to import fuel. That, that's it. It's just a fuel, liters of fuel, uh, gallons of, of fuel. That will lead you to 
a very miserable uh, life, a very miserable situation that you cannot, as as people who are not, I mean, strong enough to to, to fight against this this situation. I mean, when I'm talking about the, the, the statistics, which is the poverty, the, the unemployment, the the, um, uh, the healthcare itself. I mean, also the psychological case, the trauma that the the, the Palestinian Gaza are having uh, nowadays. All these conditions is just only because they didn't um, they didn't allow you to import just only few. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about hundreds or thousands of goods that the Gazan are not allowed to, to import it. And also they don't allow us, let me say that 90% of the uh, the Palestinian goods that they, we want to export it outside because they, they don't allow. So they mean to, to, to break your bones and to do not give you the opportunity to stand up and to say that I'm well experienced to have my country, I mean, or to lead a country. They, they, they always, I mean, the occupation want to show the Palestinians as they are not able to, to establish a country or to lead their, 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 um, uh, their, their country. I want to uh, just share with you um, something that also I, uh, sorry. Yeah, um, I want to talk about also how is, how, Actually, a friend of mine who is American, he, he, he advised me to mention it in my, my CV that you can say that I have experience with, with four wars in Gaza, which is not yani, something that everyone in the world has these, these skills. Um, but honestly, there's difference between the four, the four wars that we have. So we have in the last decades, we have in, in 2009, 2010, 2014 and the last war in 2000, uh, 2021 and there's differences between these 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 um, wars that they meant to how can I say that they, they meant to, uh, to to again to, to break your bones but I mean to in, in, of course in, in every war they were killing they were bombing the home they were um, assassinating the, the Gazan uh, 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 people, cutting the electricity lines, cutting. But in this war, there is there is there is new thing that we have to actually. They meant to to damage the street itself. I mean, for example, there was there were no roads to a ship hospital, which is the biggest hospital in Gaza Strip. So if, if we want to take our injured people to the hospital, we didn't have um, 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 uh, a road to, to go because the, the, the Israeli themselves bombing almost of the, uh, the street that lead to, um, to, the, to the hospital. It's, it's, it's not easy to, to, um, to um, I mean, they, they and also um, in, in, the, in the previous three wars, they, they, they used to open the, uh, the, the, the Christian borders. I, I'm talking about Kerem Abu Salem, which is the only gate for importing goods. But in this war, they did not even allow us to import uh, goods. So we were, we were, we were yeah, very close to, um, to hunger, very close to a uh, human uh, 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 crisis. But also, again, in, in, in this war, the Israeli um, retaliatory and indiscriminate attacks aimed to um, uh, punish civilians uh, themselves and impose collective punishment in which I mean, um, in which voice this conscious weapons are used. I mean, causing destruction in, in everywhere in, 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 in Gaza Strip. It was, it, which is really, really, really horrible. I mean, in this war, the, the, the bombing itself was, was shaking, shaking the homes itself as, as as there is, there is, there is an earthquake, which is also um, it has an, an indicator to uh, that the Israeli are using <clears throat> a new kind of of, of uh, weapons, and to all, also for the people who are used to follow the, the news, usually the Israel after every war um, conduct uh, weapons uh, uh, exhibition just to uh, to show their industry, their women industry. And if there is someone will will doubt of the the effective of this uh, effectiveness of this uh, weapon, they will say to they will tell them no, we have used it yeah, in in Gaza Strip, and you can see how much is yeah, it's it's working um, uh, uh, very well. They they used to um, uh, what happened in eleven days 
having, I mean, if we make a comparison between what happened in 2014, I mean, the wars 2014 and the, the, the last one, what they did in, in, in 11 days was bigger and heavier than what Israel did in, in, um, in, in the war of, of 2014. And maybe some of you know that they didn't allow also the journalists to enter uh, Gaza Strip. I mean, it, it was like there is, uh, uh, there is the deliberate intent to something that we, 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 were, we were scared to um, because of it. Regarding to my experience <clears throat> as, um, as a father, I think in May 11, I was interviewed by the BBC World Service and uh, I was talking about the current situation in Gaza Strip and what is going on. Um, uh, I know it's live now, but um, just here, um, maybe 60 meters behind my, uh, my, my office. And I was talking with the, uh, the BBC World about the current situation and then a heavy bumping happened. <clears throat> I mean, I didn't mean to say that I was so lucky to, uh, because the, the bombing was happening during the interview. I didn't mean, it, but I mean, the people all over the world um, had an honest opportunity to hear the sound of the bombing itself while I was talking. <clears throat> and they, they heard my second son, Karam, I called him my family cream. He's very sensitive kid, very, 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 very sensitive kid. And the people all over the world heard Karam while he was screaming. Screaming was, he was very scared and he was shaking like this. As a father, <clears throat> I mean, it's not easy. It's not easy because tens of questions will, will come into my, your mind. What, what is happening? What, what, what should you do? Should you stay at your home? Should you leave your home? Should you go to the ground floor? Should you leave the building? You don't know where is the bumpy because I only saw the, the dust of the bumpy. I didn't know if it's over, the, over my building or it's just beside me or behind my building. Or... And also to go to where? Where is the safety place that I can move my kids to? And we decided to, to go to the ground floor where, where, where are my neighbors, all of the, my neighbors in, in, in my building, just go to, they, they went to the ground floor. But the bumping, it was bum, 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 bum. Wasn't, wasn't as you, you, you used to have in the last war. The next day, I decided to move my kids to my family to Khan Yunus city, which is in the south of, um, of Gaza Strip. But before that, um, I consult my wife um, if we should do this or not. And she refused actually. At the end, I decided I had to do that because in Khan Yunus, it's safer than Gaza city itself. And my friend also, advised me to do not go because it's not it's not it's not it's not easy to it's not safe to, to drive your car 30 kilometers to the south of Gaza Strip. And during my drive out the only question was that I have into my my heart my mind if something bad happened to my family <clears throat> sorry if something bad happened to my family I'm the one who is responsible of this because I'm the one who made this decision. It's not easy because I was driving my car and no one single human in the street. No one was driving my, his car. I mean, I was alone in the street. What I saw on the road, the demolished home, bombed homes, I mean, Buildings, little buildings, little homes. A few animals like dogs were running crazily because of the bumping, the bumping, the sound of the bumping. Attacked most motorcycles, 
that means there is someone was riding his motorcycle and he's he's assassinated or have been bombed. The everything that I wanted to at that time to do not in the war. I just wanted to arrive to Hanyan City safely. Because when I was driving, I was looking to my kids through the mirror. They were in the back seat and they were crying. It's not easy again to, to, to make a decision uh, while you are under bombardments. And my friends actually are really thankful to them because they advise me to, uh, they ask me to, to write my experience. I've tried to keep my kids safe through three bombardments of Gaza. It's never been like this before. So that's what the title that the Time Magazine published it. While the original title was Bear Hunting in Gaza Strip Under Bombardments. But there is, there is, to be honest, many things to be appreciated regarding to the change, sort of the change of the media, the international media. Uh, I was lucky because I have windows to talk. I have been interviewed, tens of interviews, um, uh, which, is, which is, by the way, it's, it's, in, it's, it's a new for the Paris in Gaza. In the last decades, they, 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 they did mean to keep us silent. And also we were lucky because we have social media now, the journalism of citizen. They can't keep us silent. 55% of the TikTok users show so sorry videos under hashtag free Palestine. So if X or Y or Z of the media, international media decided to, to silence us, no. No anymore of this silence. Now we have social media and um, we use this platform very well. That's led also to, to uh, an Israeli uh, expert, um, a strategic, strategic expert, he asked the uh, Israeli government to uh, pay billion, one billion dollar annually to fight the Palestinian narration. That means we were doing well. That means the the free world was standing with the Palestinian right. We were. I know that we were under heavy bumping. We were under. massacres, genocide, whatever you want to call it. But in, inside our deep heart, we, we, we knew that the free world were supporting us. Guys, <clears throat> the, the last point that I want to talk about that we count on you, we count on you and sharing our stories. And you know that the US um, gave uh, annual assistance to Israel $3.8 billion. And this is, this is collected by your money, your tax money. We do encourage you to, to raise your voice, to talk about that you don't accept to use your money in killing my people, in killing my family, my wife Safa, Ali, 11 years, Karam, 8 years, Adam, 3 years. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fadi. I'm incredibly grateful that you were able to join us in person. It's, it's, uh, it's much better than a, than a video or an audio piece. I really, 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 truly appreciate it. Um, we will have chance at the end to ask more questions and hopefully hear more from Fadi. Um, now we're going to move on to hear from um, Ellen Fleischman. Um, Ellen 
you have been teaching a course on Israel-Palestine conflict for many years now at the University of Dayton. Um, as you mentioned, you have lived in East Jerusalem, city of Sheikh Jarrah, where this recent wave of violence began. Um, there are Palestinians living in Gaza, um, Palestinians with Israeli citizenship, East Jerusalemites, West Bank Palestinians, Palestinian refugees living outside of the occupied territories. Um, if you can provide some context specifically for the University of Dayton students um, about how we got to where we are right now. It's a big ask to do in short 10 minutes, um, but um, do what you can, we appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, it is a big ask, and if there are any students of mine out there, they know that I am not brief about this conflict because I have a lot to say, and it's very close to my heart. Um, I want to thank you for allowing me to speak, and I am going to be very selective and try to move pretty quickly through um, what I have to say. Um, so I'm going to start with a map. and. Make sure I can share the screen. I don't know, is this, is this showing up on the screen? No. All right, you know what? It, it might take too much time for me to mess around with it, so I might just, um, I might just actually leave it aside for now and go on and talk. So the map basically shows where the different um, populations of Palestine currently live, and this is something that Kayla asked me to do. She she asked me to speak about. Um, the different, I call it statuses and conditions of Palestinians today. And she called it, I think, fractions or factions or something like this. But I think that statuses defines it better. So I'm just going to start and go as fast as I can through modern Palestinian history. And it leaves out a lot. And it's very, it's focused pretty much on the Palestinian population. So I will deal with four different groups, uh, Palestinians from Jerusalem, Palestinian citizens of uh, Israel, um, and people in the West Bank and Gaza, and probably a little less on Gaza because Fadi uh, talked quite a bit about Gaza. So before um, 1948, the Nakba, Palestine was part of the Ottoman Empire from 1516 to 1918. And the, the majority of Palestinians were Muslim Arabs. And there were small minorities of Christians and um, Arab Palestinians as well. Starting in the late 1900s, the Zionist movement was founded in Europe, which called for the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine. A small number of European Jews started to immigrate to Palestine at that time. And then in 1917, during World War I, the British issued the Balfour Declaration in which they promised to support a Jewish national home in Palestine. After World War I, the land was under temporary British rule under uh, a mandate under the League of Nations. During this period, until 1948, many more Jews immigrated into the, um, into the country. And as a result, tensions between Jews and Arabs intensified from that time and led to um, increasing conflict. This resulted in the British turning the problem over to the United Nations towards the end of the mandate in 1947. The UN decided that the territory should be partitioned between Arabs and Jews. The Arabs did not accept losing the majority of their land. War broke out between Jews and Arabs in late 1947. This is really quick history, by the way. The Jews won the war and declared the founding of the state of Israel in 1948. During the war, most of the Arab population fled or were expelled from their land and became refugees as Israel refused to allow them to return to their homes. These events became known as the Nakba or disaster. 
And this is a really, uh, you know, a crucial watershed time in this history. The territories that we now know as the West Bank and Gaza were under the control of Jordan and Egypt, respectively, from 1948 until 1967, when um, a war was fought by Egypt, Syria, and Israel, during which these lands were conquered and occupied, along with East Jerusalem by Israel. So the fallout from the wars of 1948 and 1967 really continue into the present and really inform what's going on there. So I'm going to start, I'm going to talk now about sort of the different statuses of Palestinians inside Palestine. The first group um, are the Palestinians who did not leave. They were a small minority of the over 700,000 Palestinians who lived in Palestine at the time. About 150,000 people stayed. They became Israeli citizens in 1949. Many of the former Arab villages from which the majority of Palestinians fled or were deported were either destroyed or, and or occupied by Jewish immigrants. It's important to note um, that the status of Palestinian citizens of Israel has been a major part of the current events. And I think it's been lost in the news because of the, you know, the horror that's happened in Gaza. But in fact, this is a big part of what is the larger picture, I would say. From 1948 until 1968, Palestinian citizens of Israel were under military rule. This meant that their movement was restricted Travel permits from the military authorities were required for them to move from village to village. They had to carry identity cards. They could be arrested and imprisoned without charges or trial. They could be deported or transferred. Some of them became internally displaced and were not allowed to return to their homes even though they had remained inside what was considered Israel. 40% of the land belonging to Palestinian citizens of Israel was confiscated and then became land that only Jews could own. Some Israeli towns um, contained and are, um, include both Jews and Arabs. And these are the um, cities and towns where we've seen a lot of protests. Palestinian citizens of Israel were completely isolated from other Arabs uh, until 1967. So the Palestinian citizens of Israel had not really um, been perceived of as active uh, in the Palestinian struggle uh, writ large. But that's not entirely true, but I can't, I don't have time to go into that. But nonetheless, they did not, um, for the most part, they were not involved in some of the uh, intifadas that happened in the West Bank and Gaza uh, in the 80s and later. The 67 war was another watershed. And the second group I'm going to talk about are First, those who live in East Jerusalem, which Israel annexed before the war was even over. It, along with the West Bank and Gaza Strip, became uh, occupied territories. After the war, um, shortly after the war, or maybe even during the war, actually, uh, the United Nations Security Council issued Resolution 242, which affirmed that the acquisition of territory by force is not considered uh, legal. And under the Hague Conventions and international law, these territories are under illegal Israeli occupation and control. Jerusalem under the 1947 UN plan was supposed to be under uh, international control because of the importance of the uh, monotheistic holy sites located there. The Muslim holy sites uh, in the Haram Sharif compound, which is the um, the plateau that contains the Al-Aqsa Mosque, notably, uh, is the third holiest site of Islam. And it has been under Jordanian and Palestinian jurisdiction um, since 1948. These holy sites have, been, have frequently been the scene of uh, provocative Israeli police presence and actions that have led to demonstrations and violence. Um, and we've seen this, uh, this actually was what uh, caused or precipitated actually the uh, Hamas strikes, um, missile strikes inside Israel was um, these events in the mosque area. 
Palestinians with Jerusalem permits and residency can take Israeli citizenship, but most don't, as they don't accept the, annex the annexation of East Jerusalem. Lately, Israel has been stripping many East Jerusalem rights, uh, Jerusalemites of their residency rights. Israel redrew the boundaries of what constitutes Jerusalem, excluding many Arab neighborhoods from the municipality and building Jewish settlements, incorporating them into the municipality in order to increase the Jewish population and decrease the Arab population. So the forced removal of Palestinians from their homes in Sheikh Jarrah this month are seen by Palestinians as part of a larger plan to expel Palestinians from other parts of Israel and in fact also um, the West Bank and Gaza. And some of the areas where this has um, been contested include the Negev area in the south and um, places like uh, Lidda or Lod, which has been the scene of a lot of struggle um, and tension in the recent events. The third group of Palestinians um, are those who live in the West Bank. They've been under Israeli occupation like the others for more than 50 years. Long story short, over half a century they have experienced illegal expropriations of Palestinian land, the illegal movement of Jewish settlers onto those lands, uh, administrative detention without charges and trial, and um, a high rate of um, imprisonment, checkpoints and movement restrictions, special ID cards that they must carry at all times or be arrested, um, imprisonment, imprisonment for sometimes arbitrary and or political acts, and basically interference and control in all aspects of their lives. Many of them live in refugee camps um, as they fled from the coast uh, to Jordanian controlled territory in 1948. And some became double refugees in 1967 fleeing from the war, <coughs> excuse me, which took place also in the West Bank. Um, I think it's important to recognize though that also Many West Bankers uh, never left their homes and have lived in uh, villages and towns in the West Bank um, since pre-1948. The fourth group of Palestinians are the Gazans. And in 1948, Gaza was a small, largely rural, a fairly thinly populated area. During the Nakba, many Palestinians from the southern coastal villages and towns fled to Gaza where they have lived ever since. Um, and many Palestinians trace their roots to the villages in that part of Palestine. After 1967, um, when it was initially under Egyptian control, the Strip came under Israeli military control and the Gazans uh, fiercely resisted this for quite a few years. In fact, Gaza was uncontrollable by the uh, IDF um, even into 1970. And Gaza is now one of the most densely populated areas on the planet. Um, Fadi gave some of the statistics, more than 70%, probably much higher than that. I don't have good statistics of its 2 million people are refugees. Um, he mentioned the high level of poverty. He's mentioned also the, um, the basic scene in Gaza really is like one of living in a prison because Gazans have been completely cut off from Israel, from Egypt, from the West Bank, and it is very, very difficult for Gazans to leave. They need uh, hard to obtain permits to go outside for medical treatment, education, employment, visits to the holy sites in Jerusalem, to visit relatives, or basically to do anything outside of Gaza. And they have to go through an, a huge huge checkpoint, which is almost like going through an airport terminal. In the only parliamentary elections held by the Palestinian Authority, the militant Islamic group Hamas won the elections, which led to Gaza basically being punished and becoming a kind of political persona non grata. Most of the early 21st century, Gaza has been either under siege or under attack by Israel. Um, I've probably run beyond my 10 minutes that I've been allowed. 
I feel like this is a very, very sort of you know, down and dirty recitation of the different groups that are living in historic Palestine. I think it's also important to recognize that uh, one of the effects of the recent events has been to, it's been extraordinary and to me a very positive development is to see how people, the Palestinian people in these different uh, statuses have become extremely unified, which brings me back to my memories of being around for the first Intifada when there was incredible solidarity and unity and hope. Um, and I think it's you know a little strange to think of hope considering the situation now, but um, I think Fadi sort of uh, alluded to it by talking about popular opinion is being changed. So that is, I'll try to leave on a hopeful note. Thank you, Ellen. Um, and yes, this is a lot of history that you packed in there. And um, specifically for UD students, there's more to learn. Um, there's resources and, and people like Ellen <laughs> have from this community who can, who can provide more and more information. Thank you. Um, Sam, I'm going to um, come over to you. Um, if you don't mind, I, I, I recently read a piece of yours um, that you published which was titled, um, Israeli Social Fabric is Ripping at the Seams. Um, Israel has reached apartheid, the antithesis of Judaism's long tradition of social justice. Um, you quoted yourself in, in that piece, and it, I, I just wanted to bring it here. Um, you said, I'm absolutely convinced that there is no military solution to this conflict. Israel has proven it cannot win despite its military power and Palestinians have proven they cannot lose despite their never ending sacrifices. But not winning and not losing is not good enough. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing you speak. I just wanted to make sure that was included in there um, and thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I thank the Dayton Center for Human Rights uh, as well as the students. And for the students, I'll start by saying this case, Israel-Palestine, can be the foundation for anything you want to study. You name the topic, this can be a case study for it, political or otherwise. As I'm talking, I don't know if you can hear that, I just opened my window. There's firing coming from the Amadi refugee camp next door. Um, I'm a business person by day, an activist and writer by night. I relocated from Youngstown, Ohio after the Oslo Accords were signed, uh, hoping to uh, come to Palestine, because I wasn't born here, I was born in Youngstown, to uh, engage myself in economic development. And as I proceed, I'm going to split what I want to say into two parts, um, about five minutes each, and I'm going to continue where Ellen left off and try to continue in the big picture for people who are learning this for the first time or just getting their feet wet, it's important to focus on the context before you dive into the many, many, many different details that you could. So when I got here, I, I, I actually was already hired by a group of investors to put together uh, as part of a two-person team, the Palestine Telecommunications Company. Like you would do anywhere you go to build a business, you have to learn the environment that you're working in. Let me give you a snapshot of the environment as I recall it at that point. First, there was forced geographic separation on the ground. Gaza had already started to be separated from the West Bank in a more structured way. But in addition to people under occupation, I understood immediately I could not hire Palestinians from outside the country who are very well qualified because Israel controls who gets in and who gets out. So this geographic separation theme became a real one, even in a business context. Then I learned that there was no direct connection to the outside world. And that applies to people as well as it applies to goods and services and equipment. Uh, I, I had my own case, you can look it up in the New York Times, I had an op-ed at the time, where I was being threatened by not being allowed to come back into the country because as an American citizen, non-Jewish, I could only come here as a tourist that has to renew their tour, tourist visa every three months. So the whole issue of not having access to the Palestinian labor pool en masse meant that I'm left with only those Palestinians in my immediate vicinity. Then I had to learn how to operate, and we didn't take this in the Youngstown State University, 
how to operate with about six different currencies at the same time. If you open up a Palestinian's wallet, you will find the Israeli shekel. That's what we use every day to buy our falafel sandwiches. You'll find US dollars. That's what we buy more larger assets with because it's a more stable currency. You'll find the Jordanian dinar because we're actually very related to Jordan. Um, if, you're in Egypt, if you're in Gaza, you might find people with Egyptian pound in their pocket because if they can exit, they can exit through to Egypt. Uh, and of course, with the advent of the Euro, we all have Euros as well. If you're really unsure of the politics of this place, you'll own gold. gold. You won't believe in currencies. That's why you see so many gold shops around. People buy their security by holding gold if they can afford it. And then I learned that I had to get involved, again, something we didn't learn a lot at the Youngstown State, that I had to manage with multiple laws applying to the business I was creating. Ottoman rule, Ottoman laws were still, and still are intact here, mainly as they applied to land, as we're seeing play out in Sheikh Jarrah today. Uh, UK laws, British law, is actually a whole body of law that was applied here and is still being applied in different ways, shapes, or forms. Jordanian law, because the Jordanians were here for a period of time. In Egypt, some Egyptian law remnants remain. And then you have when the Palestinian Authority was established, Palestinian legislated laws, which for, for the most part were a, 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 an accumulation of all those past laws trying to be brought forward as Palestinian. The cut and paste doesn't work so good in the legal world. You're left with a lot of cracks. Um, and then there's a kicker law, and I'll get to that one in a second. Then I had to really face that we are facing a nascent Palestinian authority. Incompetent, and I don't say that in a negative way, I say it in a professional, practical way. They had no idea of how to create the foundation for a state, or let alone absorb the trappings of the state that were dumped in their, on, on their laps. And when you don't have any government in place, you guys know this in Washington DC in January, right? You get a little bit worried because as much as we hate government, it has a role in our lives and can't be just dealt out uh, arbitrarily. And then I had to face that our court system, our justice system here is underdeveloped. Over the years, the caseload was decades old sometimes, especially when land uh, cases were brought. So you didn't really have a court system to fall back on. And above and above, beyond all that, the realization back in the 90s when I came that the, the state donors, countries who donate to Palestinians are really upholding the Palestinian Authority. They're propping it up. And no money comes for free. All monies come with interference. So one day you're juggling US desires here. One day you're juggling EU desires here. One day you're juggling Saudi Arabian desires here. The Palestinian desire was brushed aside for the most part because first of the incompetence in the, in the leadership, but also without the funds to actually implement any of those desires. And then the kicker that I was talking about in terms of law, it turns out no matter what those laws, all the different forms of them said, we had Israeli military orders for, at that time it was 30 years or so, which trumped all else. A military order was the primary rule of law under military occupation. That's a picture in a very short way of what I was facing, thinking about how to build a company. So you can imagine the challenge that was in front of us. I came to build a telecommunications company. It was a section of the Oslo Peace Accord, actually article number 36 to be exact. Long story short, the first paragraph of that article said, Palestinians have a right to build separate and independent, those are the words that are used, telecommunication networks. We are now 26 years into the Oslo process. And although we did build a successful telecom company, it is nowhere near separate and independent because Israel did not allow that to happen. By military force, by military order, they refused to allow us not only to implement the Oslo Accord,
but they went, we went above and beyond the text of the accord to make sure that we cannot build a proper system. I was actually, and I'm proud, to have been the person who was in Gaza building the first office in Tel El-Hawa for the Palestine Telecommunications Company. I understand, Fadi, that was bombed, this bombing, uh, and actually last bombing as well. So building just to see it destroyed in front of you does not give an appetite for investors or professionals to actually engage. And this time around in Gaza, you would have to be out of your mind to actually invest real money in Gaza, as much as they need it. That's why we're going to see free money, if there is such a thing in the world, and all that free money comes with tons of strings attached. And we're gonna see, again, the US use those strings to try to better its political hand. So to move on, where did I learn the larger context during these 25 years? Really in sickening detail, if I, if I wanted to say, and I'll just list a couple. World Bank reports. The World Bank is not the most progressive organization in the world. Read their reports that come out uh, semi-annually, uh, I think, on uh, the West Bank in Gaza and East Jerusalem for that matter. And you will get a mind-boggling amount of information of how much damage is being done by this prolonged occupation. As someone involved in business, I read the UNCTAD reports. UNCTAD is the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. They do a deep dive in the business and trade world, and you can see the damage being done in every single sector. I read the EU reports. I read the UN Special Repertoire for Human Rights reports, which are amazingly, amazingly well-documented, to the point where Israel stopped allowing the Special Repertoire to reach Israel and Palestine, even though it is the Special Repertoire for Human Rights in Israel and Palestine, He's not allowed to come into to Israel. So he works from abroad. And then I read more recently the Beit Salem reports, the Yeshdin reports, the Breaking the Silence reports, the Peace Now reports. All of those that I mentioned up until now are Israeli organizations. And more recently, the International Human Rights Watch report, which is a damning report about what is happening here during the last 30, 40 years. And of course, when I wanted to dig deeper, and I say this as well because I see one of my teachers here, John Quigley, Professor John Quigley, he wrote the case for Palestine, an international law perspective. This is actually the second version. I read the first version as a teenager, probably in Youngstown, Ohio, that started to give me the framing of what does law have to do with all of this? I highly recommend that. So as we move forward, the characteristics added to the above environment after 26, 27 years of experience here, you have four times more settlements as the peace process was ongoing. Israel continued to build and move settlers into the occupied territory. That's not an entity looking to reach a resolution. There's a loss of a political horizon. There is total impunity toward Israel. Last seen with the Security Council issue during the Gaza assault last week, where the U.S. just blocked even a statement, let alone a resolution, from coming out. Uh, and then today, we have the Human Rights Council uh, issuing a resolution to hold an investigation to see if basically war crimes were co committed last week by both sides. And the U.S. issuing a statement, even though they're, they withdrew from the Human Rights Council, issuing a statement that that's not helpful. Really? It's not helpful to know on both sides who committed war crimes? There's something wrong with that logic. In short, there's a de-development process in place, and it's de-development on steroids. Gaza has been sieged and bombed during the last 15 years, 100 years back. 100, not 10, not 15, not a billion, not a million dollars away from redevelopment, because the, the mindset of somebody under siege doesn't get resolved by throwing money at it. There's an entire generation in Gaza that does not know their entire life, what it means to have 24 seven electricity. That takes a toll. And basically the US under any president, especially Trump, but under any president is the problem. And I highly recommend and refer to you to the Harvard professor, Stephen Walt, who today wrote in the foreign policy an article entitled, it's time to end the special relationship with Israel. So those are the, that's the context. 
I have a couple minutes if I have uh, just to move to like a, a really, really big picture because I want you to think of the pillars of your thinking before you dive into opinions. And the next thing I'm going to share with you are a couple of those pillars that I think we all have to basically decide on for ourselves. No matter what we're talking about, and I, that came up on the screen, right? Kyla, okay. No matter what we're talking about, Palestine, Israel, annexation, the Oslo Accords, peace to prosperity, the deal of the century, you can add all the words you want. The conversation is basically the same. What is it? I start by asking you a question that you have to answer if you want to have a logical discussion with someone. On what world order side are you on in 2021? Chaos in the pre-World War II era or the rules-based world in the post-World War II era? Now, if you notice, the rules-based world is not perfect. The colors are not solid. The lines are not perfect, but there is rhyme and rhythm to a rules-based order. The chaos-based world, we got a taste of it during the last four years in the US. It gets worse if you wanna adopt that. And then based on what you answer, I go forward. If you wanted the chaos ethos, then it's okay to say God was a real estate agent. He gave somebody this land and uh, story over, nothing to discuss. And I tell the Israelis who think this, think again, because on our side, we also have people who think God gave them this land, and that's a never ending conflict. I prefer to adopt a rules based ethos. In, rules -based, in a rules based world, it is three things. Of course, it's many things beyond that, but it's three pillars to a stool. Pillar number one is the Charter of the United Nations. Read it, it's short, it's to the point. It still applies after wars in the world and disputes in the world. It is a reference point that every single state in the UN who's a member signs on to. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's a pillar of that stool. And the International Court of Justice. All three of these are the pillar. What is the chair of the stool? It is all the things at the bottom of the screen there. UN Security Council resolutions, General Assembly resolutions, conventions, treaties, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the impl implementation of those three pillars. We need to decide, because if you wanna have a rules-based argument, I'll, I'll talk about rules. If you wanna have a chaos-based argument, I can't do it by myself. I have to call the military head of Hamas so he can advise me how close they are to building the next missile, because I don't know personally. We have to decide. And I put this here just so we have a reference point as well. I'm not going to read this. This is excerpts from the Declaration of Independence of Palestine and of Israel. Notice in blue circle there, both of them reflect a chaos-based world. And in the red circle, both of them reflect a rules-based world. It's like both sides are hedging their bets. And I think it's up to us as civil society, as voices of concern, to make sure that both of these parties adopt the rules-based world. When I think about the Israeli one, I look up there and I say, it used the words and words matter in law and in politics. It says land of Israel one time. It says Eretz Israel 10 times. It says state of Israel seven times. What, what are we talking, are those the same thing or not? And I can give a whole talk about how they're not the same thing. So in 2012, again, I won't go into details, the Palestinians were fed up, the Oslo process had failed, peace process had failed. So the, the Palestinians went to the United Nations and said, world, you decide. Is Palestine worthy of statehood or not? What was the result? 138 countries said yes, nine said no. And the nine embarrassingly are listed on the right-hand side there, uh, the US, Canada, uh, Panama and you know the US put itself with those Pacific islands, all four or five of them that can fit in my living room. This was a historic missed opportunity for Israel. They could have closed a chapter because the Palestinians through this resolution were acknowledging yet again for the third time that Israel exists. Instead, they pushed back. 
Again, these are too much to go into detail. This is a map on the left, maybe the map that was going to come up before, of the West Bank, of the, of the partition plan that was mentioned in 1949 or 1948. It was the partition, 1947, I'm sorry. It's the partition. The green part was supposed to be Israel, and the orangish part was supposed to be Palestine, and the red part in the middle was supposed to be Jerusalem. What happened after all those wars that Ellen spoke about is what we ended up on the right hand side. The, the, the striped brown part in the middle is the West Bank and Gaza Strip on the shore, and the rest is Israel. The Palestinians, after a long time, decades, accepted that they would create their state on the right hand side, West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. The US came forward, not Trump, the US came forward because up until now, Biden has not revoked it and said, we have a vision. On the left side is Israel. It's all the brown part within the historic Palestine map, as well as those brown circles inside the green parts. And rightfully so, the settlers said, we can't accept this. I wouldn't as well if I was an Israeli settler inside of one of those brown circles inside the green part. And the right side was supposed to be Palestine, not contiguous at all, without a connection to the outside world. If you read the document as I did, as very few people did, you will see that there's nothing about, there's nothing that relates to a state in the formal sense in this document. We are still waiting for Biden to revoke it. Lastly, and I say, why can't we just be Palestinians and be left alone? And I say that because a couple of decades ago, uh, 20 years ago, uh, there was a, an advisor, his name was Gov Weisblas. He was the advisor to Ariel Sharon, the person who unilaterally disengaged from Gaza. And he was on record as saying, quote, we educated the world to understand that there is no one to talk to. And we, rece we received a no one to talk to certificate. That certificate will be revoked only when this and this happens, when Palestine becomes Finland. And then more recently, we had David Friedman. Let me remind you, he was the US ambassador to Israel because some people get confused and think he was the Israeli ambassador to Israel. And he said, you don't have to live with the Palestinian state that they just proposed. You have to live with the Palestinian state when the Palestinians become Canadians. And I end my slide and my talk by saying one thing that I can say for sure. These Gaza children, if they're still alive, are never going to become fin Finns or Canadians. That I'm sure of. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Sam. Um, as a, a human rights center, a lot of what you just said was uh, um, incredibly important for us. And I know that Emily is going to dovetail a little bit into some of that as well. Um, but first, I'm going to um, I turn to Amani, um, you know, what I said in the beginning, the stories and experiences over these last couple of weeks are, are incredibly important for us as a, as a community to understand um, more about what is happening. And Amani, I'm just going to quote you um, for a minute um, in correspondence with um, my husband, Moriel. You wrote, um, getting messages that settlers which has become the new discursive reference to all Jewish Israelis taking part in the attacks are armed and planning to come to Haifa. Um, can you tell us about the experiences of those days and evenings and also about this discursive shift you mentioned? Thank you, Kayla. And uh, thank you for inviting me to speak today. I will try to follow Fadi and Sam and Ellen. I don't know if I'm gonna be successful in doing that, but I will try. Um, so I was asked to speak about the experience of living in a mixed city. Um, and the, the more I thought about it, the less I actually knew what I wanted to say and what I wanted to share with you. Because there's, as, as you can see, there's so much to say. Um, so I, I decided to start from the beginning. And this is also a bit controversial, what the beginning is. But before talking about my own experience, um, I'd like to refer to the idea of, of Haifa being a, a mixed city, um, something which I think is, is very relevant, uh, first of all, to the recent violence, but also to the ongoing, now very distinct uh, process of, of what we can call identity work 
uh, for Palestinians, and especially for Palestinian citizens of, of Israel. Um, so if we look at, even prior to the establishment of, of the state of Israel in 48, Haifa was what some believe to be a truly mixed city with almost an even number of Arabs and Jews uh, living in it. Uh, Arabs were a little bit more, but it, it was almost even. So some argue that this actually helped in forming a relatively tolerant uh, atmosphere in, in the city for the minority of remaining Palestinians after the Nakba. Um, but in, in 48, Haifa lost almost 95% of its Palestinian residents, um, including most of its financial and cultural elites. Um, and the city fell, uh, I'm not gonna go over the, the history, but the city fell under military uh, rule, whereby the remaining Palestinian population was, was really focused in, in very specific neighborhoods, which were, and, and some still are, uh, very much like ghettos inside a very big city. Uh, some, I don't know if you've have heard of the names of these neighborhoods, but some were actually also involved in, in what we call the recent violence, um, like Halisa, Wadi Nisnas, and, and so on. Um, so, so Palestinians, uh, and I'm going to speak, and obviously I can't speak in the name of all Palestinians, I'm going to speak of, about Palestinians in, in Haifa now, but, but then I will speak only about myself, but Palestinians were disconnected basically from the rest of the Arab world and obviously from the Palestinian nation. Um, they were living within what is now called the Israeli borders without leadership, without land, without livelihood, um, facing also internal displacement. And they were politically tamed, uh, pacified under the military rule and even after it. So Israel's primary mission regarding the remaining Palestinians, at least, was assimilation, erasing Palestinian nationality. Uh, and with time, also Palestinians stopped being Palestinians. They became Israel's Arabs or Arab Israelis and, and, and many other names that were given to this specific group, also by the group itself, which is, um, I think, part of, of the story a very important part of the story. And, and institutions, uh, specifically also Haifa municipality, um, institutions funded by the state offered various cultural programs to depoliticize Palestinians in Haifa. And with the end also of the, of the military, military uh, rule, a, a flow of migration from villages uh, mainly in the Galilee took place as people were searching for work, for education. Um, many of the residents in Haifa today, I myself am not from Haifa. Originally, I live in Haifa now, um, like many others. There are very few people who are originally from Haifa because most of them were, were actually displaced. Um, and and many, many throughout the years experienced improvement in their economic situation. Um, and so Palestinians realized with time that Israel is not going anywhere um, and their hope for advancement lay in, in, in individual integration rather than national separation. And, and I feel that this, this was part of, the, of, of what created the group that Ellen referred to as, as Palestinian citizens of Israel. Um, and obviously this, this varied uh, from one place to the other, but specifically in Haifa. So today the Palestinian scene in Haifa um, is mostly cultural, um, but it's not national in any way. So when talking about Haifa being a mixed city or what some like to call Haifa is known as the city of coexistence. It's not only a mixed city, it's the city of coexistence, but this coexistence is, is not really between Israelis and Palestinians. It's also not represented as being between Israelis and Palestinians. It's a, it's a coexistence between religious groups, uh, between Jews, Christians, Muslims, Baha'is, etc. So while collective, national, social, and cultural Palestinian representations are largely absent um, 
from the from the city, various opportunities were were actually provided, uh, mainly economic. And when compared, th this is true also, especially when compared to Palestinians, um, Palestinians in, in villages living in villages in Israel, and obviously Palestinians in, in East Jerusalem and in, in the West Bank and, and Gaza. So this provided some send of, sense of, of physical and ontological security for Palestinians. And when I talk about ontological security, I mean having a very firm sense of, of identity that's not necessarily national, uh, but a sense of continuity in that sense, uh, of, of some kind of order, of knowing who you are and being able to be or exist uh, in a place and, and be guided by practices, daily practices. Um, I've been living in Haifa for, for three years. Uh, before that, I lived in Jerusalem for eight years. Um, and I'm originally from a Druze village, uh, very close to Haifa, um, called the Sophia, if anyone knows it. So th this, the, the, the idea of, of, of identity work made me think about who I am in these different places. And it, when I was in my village, I was referred to as a Christian. As I said, it's a Druze village, so I was the Christian. When I was in Jerusalem, I was the girl from the north. Uh, we were people who came from the north to study at Hebrew U were largely referred to as, you know, northerners, uh, especially by uh, Jerusalemites. And when I moved to Haifa, I was sometimes Arab, but mostly I was nothing. There was, n there was nothing to characterize or label who I am, uh, which some people might say is a good thing, but Palestinian identity in the city is almost completely ignored. Um, and this is what I felt and, and, and I've been in Haifa, I've been living in Haifa for the past few years, but I studied in Haifa also when I was a, when I was a kid. Um, so when talking about coexistence, the way I experience it, at least, it's merely tolerance. It's a tolerance of the non-Jewish existence in the city but not necessarily a recognition of, of what that existence is and who the other um, is in the city of Haifa. And obviously in other cities, I think even Haifa is a, is a very, um, I, I, can't, I can't even compare it to other places. Um, we, we've heard about, I assume we, we've all heard about what happened in Led and Lod uh, and other places. Haifa is very moderate in that sense. Um, but this, even this coexistence is basically on, based on, on one side, uh, not having any identity or a very conditional, conditioned one. Um, and this is, although this is not new, it's always been this way, um, always been this case in Haifa and assuming other mixed cities, but still people continue to exist because it was, it was almost, normal you know it was the normal thing to do until recently and I think this is the shift um, the, something has definitely changed in the past uh, month if we can say um, I don't claim to know <laughs> what has changed but I do know this uh, and Ellen touched on this um, a bit but what for me, what was accepted as normal in the past is not normal anymore, largely because the, the security of the people, the Palestinians living in Haifa, um, talking both, both about physical and ontological security, in their feeling, in their perception, it's gone. That security is gone. And if I had to sum up my experience during the recent round of violence, um, it, it was mostly about fear. Um, 
in the past people were afraid but they were afraid from the things that they watched on the news they were disturbed um now people two weeks ago i i was very scared to be living in haifa i was living in a city where supremacists were roaming the streets um i was texting uh friends about this including gala's husband maury um they were marking arab houses um they were attacking doing almost whatever they want basically um and all this was done while protected by the police um so it wasn't really a riot or a disturbance or a group of supremists it was systematic structural violence taking place in a co in a city of coexistence so it was something that i i couldn't be put under the title of normal so Palestinians in Haifa um and and I, I guess this is the where the change comes in Palestinians in Haifa young men and women who also are not originally from Haifa were being targeted um uh, facing not only the supremacist groups but a whole apparatus almost of, of an apparatus that condones violence and in the past the idea of being able to exist as an arab in the mixed city might have overshadowed whatever need there was to be palestinian or to to declare yourself a palestinian um and that also affected um, um shifted reconstructed we we can use so many words but the very identity of palestine of being a palestinian what that means for palestinians in israel became different it's different for palestinians to be with an israeli citizenship from palestinians living in the west bank and we've been hearing a bit about each of these experiences and and obviously palestinians living in gaza and in east jerusalem but during the past couple of weeks being an arab was not an option anymore um and and so palestinian identity almost reemerged for this group this was evident mainly among the younger generation for the way i saw it um who were looking for a way to to almost reorganize reunite uh restore some sense of security in the palestinian neighborhoods and in their own identities uh, and their sense of who they are so if a few days ago and with this i will i will conclude because i i feel also that the a big part of the story was not was not told um of of the past uh month uh the occurrences of of what happened obviously we were all very horrified with, with what happened in gaza i think also with west bank but uh, the streets of uh of the mixed cities so called mixed cities um were also uh having their own war <laughs> in a sense and that story was not told not by the israeli media and not by the international um media so a, a few days ago um the ministry of interior announced a new campaign um in israel and it's called law law and order um the border police uh along with special units declared their intention to arrest all those involved in what the israeli media called the riots or disturbances um and so far more than 400 young men and women and this could be added to another um total of almost 2000 i don't know the exact numbers but um were arrested um uh, most of them are palestinians and and to to be better prepared uh for the arrests young men and women in haifa specifically um are using social media and fadi talked a bit about this uh applications such as whatsapp uh telegram now it's moved to signal to have the messages erased um to discuss and reorganize and i think this is something that has never been done before um the structural violence may not be new but the attempts to confront it collectively um are and uh i was lucky enough to be invited to one of the 
to join one of these groups, which now includes more than 200 members, um, all young men and women who knew nothing about each other. I know almost no one in this group. The only thing that they knew is the fact that they all need to protect their neighborhoods and to protect themselves. And for me, that was amazing to see these people reorganize uh, under such conditions of lack of leadership, uh, a lack of any resources other than the media. Um, so far, they organized activities in various Arab neighborhoods in the city, uh, demonstrations, created hotlines to support families of detainees. They are almost daily at the courthouse. Um, they're sending live updates and it's just like history in the making to see these messages. It's, it's def almost defying any effort to make them invisible. Um, and I think the most important shift in Palestinian identity in Haifa, if I can call it a shift, is the fact that today it's actually declared as a Palestinian identity. Uh, people might be scared, but they feel that they can do something about it, not as individuals, but collectively. And I don't know if I'm optimistic. I don't know if I can talk about hope. And I don't know where we'll be in a month or two. But I do know that right now, we can't go back to where we used to be. Uh, not even in Haifa, which would be the easiest of all. Uh, and people are calling for, for almost a new normal, uh, but this time the new normal has to be um, uh, one where the Palestinians are equal partners in deciding how it would look like. Um, I will send updates, <laughs> but that's, that's my experience in, in a mixed city, which hopefully one day I can say is the city of coexistence, but Definitely not today. And thank you for listening. Amani, thank you so much. I think this is it, so important for everybody to hear and this is absolutely new. And, um, you know, as you said, this is not being covered and not being talked about um, as much as it should be. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, we are over time. I'm conscious of that. Um, but I, you know, we have a lot of amazing speakers. This event is also recorded. So um, I apologize that we're not going to be getting to Q&A, uh, but we are going to have our last speaker. And I hope that you can bear with us um, for another 10 minutes. Emily is extraordinary. So I really, really <laughs> hope you'll stay with us and it's, it's, worth, it's worth the wait. Um, Emily, I'm going to turn this over to you and you can take us home. <laughs> um, but uh, um, I will just quickly, because I've been doing quotes for everybody, and um, you've been quoted saying, um, the occupation will not end so long as the overwhelming majority of countries condemn Israeli settlements as illegal, yet allow their own corporations to prop them up with impunity. Um, can you tell us more about this in general and how it relates also to the context of the current crisis? And thank you for being with us. Sure. So no pressure, right, uh, <laughs> to uh, to bring us home. Um, I just I just want to say I've I've um, really enjoyed listening to every single one of you, um, my fellow panelists, and there's been um, at least one uh, or more things that each of you have said that really resonated, um, both in terms of of my experiences uh, over the past few weeks um, and over the past few decades. Um, and also uh, in terms of kind of a vision for, for a way forward. Um, and I, you know, I, I mentioned in the very beginning that I, I live in, in Jaffa and Yaffa. Um, I could also talk about um, the, the kind of painful um, past few weeks and really it's still alive um, right now as we, as we speak. Um, and definitely the sense that you shared, Amani, that there's no going back. I'm trying to take a lot of hope from that, but there are a lot of questions around what that means. Um, and particularly as a, as a Jewish Israeli living in, in Yaffa, I have a lot of questions about how to be the best ally um, in whatever 
does move forward. So I'll, I just wanted to speak to that for a second. Um, but now I'm going to move more towards how I tend to do a lot of my um, allyship, which is through uh, my through legal practice. And I've been asked to talk about how law is abused to justify or legitimize human rights abuses. And I have a lot to say about that. I, I write about it. I talk about it. I think it comes through in, um, in the, the pleadings that I write to, to courts, whether they're Israeli or other. Um, but I would also like, and maybe this is how I'll bring us home, to offer how law can, and I believe should, even if it's flawed, be wielded by human rights advocates to push back against oppressive regimes and systematic injustices and actually serve to defend human rights. So it's a, it's a, tricky, um, it, it's a tricky goal that requires a lot of, a lot of uh, creativity, but I'd like to put forward that, um, that that's um, something worthwhile for us to, to, be, to be doing. So, I think we're probably all familiar with, with general critiques of the law. I don't think that it's unique to international law. Um, if, you know, if there are law students um, in the audience and, and you have not um, been exposed to, to critiques such as uh, the law being politics by other means or the law um, being dictated by those in power or by, by the ruling class, uh, onto, onto others, oftentimes taking on a tyranny of the majority um, and, and sort of this line of, of, um, of critique, then go to your law professors ASAP and, um, and, and ask them uh, what they think about it. Um, on the international legal scene, you know, we have um, a long history um, of, of, the, of international law's origins, um, particularly when it comes to the law of armed conflict or laws of war, um, both in terms of, of kind of the, the idea of the global north dominating the global south, setting standards that, that are applicable or suitable um, for the north and not as suitable for the south. Um, and of course, um, a lot of these, a lot of the major laws that, that impact, um, you know, are even the conflict right now, right, were uh, written during the height of colonialism and in many ways um, often framed um, with an eye toward protecting those interests. There's a lot to be said to counter that. There are a lot of ways in which the global south and um, Africa in particular has been um, had, has been Africa and also South America quite vocal um, in, in drafting different um, human rights um, instruments. And, and so this is a debate that I'm just kind of going to put out there and, and, um, and keep in our, in our minds. Um, when we focus in on what that means for, for Israel and Palestine, um, and even for, for recent weeks, um, it, you know, it becomes quite relevant in, in this question of um, how do we examine, for instance, uh, what Sam brought up, um, whether there have been war crimes committed um, by Hamas, by, by Israel. Um, you know, when we look at what standards each is held to, you know, there are questions that come up, such as should a state with an official uh, military such as Israel be held to the same standards when it comes to um, you know, the uh, principle of distinction against between combatants and military objectives and on the one hand and civilians and civilian objects on the other hand as Hamas or other non-state armed groups um, which do not have the same resources, do not have the same status, right? There, there are um, critiques of, of whether um, this, is, this is in fact a fair way um, to examine the actions um, of each of these parties. Um, when we even think about using the word war, it suggests some kind of parity that we don't actually have when we look at Gaza, Hamas, and, and Israel, right? 
um, not in terms of, of uh, diplomatic power, not in terms of, of economic resources, not in terms of person power, um, and on and on. So um, we find a lot of ways that international law falls short. But even if we wanna, if we wanna hold uh, you know, the law to, to, to the letter, um, we find trouble, for instance, um, looking, looking at a, a military necessity analysis. So when Israel is, is um, if it is going to, for instance, Israel, Israeli state actors will be, if they were to be asked by, say, the International Criminal Court to, um, to explain, right, to defend their actions now or in Protective Edge or um, in, in, in other um, assaults in, uh, on Gaza in, in, in the meantime, they would have to go through a process that international humanitarian law or international law of armed conflict, just a side note, those are actually the same thing. They refer to the same body of, of uh, Hague regulations and, and Geneva conventions um, and other customary international law on, um, on armed conflict. But those who usually emphasize the use of international humanitarian law as a term uh, generally have the, the civilians who get caught up in, um, in these wars in mind and are putting the emphasis on, on their rights and protections, whereas those who may talk about the laws of armed conflict may be thinking more about what armies have the authority or right to do um, in, in these conflicts. So the military necessity, regardless of which term we use, the military necessity paradigm exists and what it what it tells us to do uh, is that we have to in each situation look at from the military's perspective whether there was a legitimate objective um, and whether the method of warfare used whether the target chosen and the method of warfare used were proportionate in the sense that they did not uh, that they outweighed, right? That the advantage to be gained outweighed the damage that was done. And that damage, this is like a mathematical equation, right? The damage is the damage to your neighborhood, Fadi, or the, the electricity, or the, um, you know, the Al Jazeera tower, or a school, or a hospital. And the question is not, the, the, the mere destruction of innocent civilians or the mere destruction of a hospital or, uh, or school, right, is not in and of itself illegal. It's a, it's a question, right? The law tells us to, to, to ask this question of whether it's justified, it's worth it, right? It's balanced, counterbalanced in this equation by the military gain. And this is one of the most cruel um, exercises that that international law does, and of course, there's nothing that's not cruel about war and about fighting. Um, but I think that there are a lot of questions to be asked, and and in particular, um, when the war zone is a place like Gaza, which, as Ellen mentioned, is one of the most densely populated uh, places in the world, there's almost no chance of hitting even a military target that international law would approve of, right, as a, as a legitimate target without also causing massive civilian damage. And there need to be more questions about whether this paradigm is still relevant, is still effective, is still legal um, when, we, when the circumstances are changing or when the circumstances look like they do uh, in Gaza. So, you know, this is, this is one kind of, I think, um, very, very relevant example for right now, but it's, it's not unique at all. And we don't have to even bring ourselves to the, you know, kind of e extreme case of, of these assaults uh, on Gaza to see how international law is also in many ways failing Palestinians and failing human rights, even during peacetime. 
even in East Jerusalem, in the West Bank, right? When we look at the settlements, the settlements themselves are, are a war crime, right? The, the transfer of population from the territory of the occupying power into the, into the territory that it occupies, um, whether direct or indirect, right? Israel doesn't have to put people on buses. It just has to set up the conditions that allow them to relocate um, is a war crime. And, 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 you know, Kayla quoted me saying that as long as the, the world kind of nods its head, like, yep, you know, that's, that's not legal, but, um, but does nothing to stop all the different actors, both state and private, um, that continue to perpetuate and expand those settlements, um, then, then we have a lack of enforcement of the law that exists. But what we also have within Israel and within the Israeli court system is a, is a kind of picking and choosing of, um, of the law, right? On the one hand, Israel is one of the only occupying powers in the world to ever uh, refer to itself as that. And, and I'm setting aside the kind of identity crisis between the state, you know, between the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the, and the army and, and the courts. But suffice it to say that, you know, in Israel, there, there is uh, at least a, um, a loose acceptance of the fact that, that it is waging an occupation. But at the same time, it is using uh, occupation law selectively, right? Either to its, to its advantage or disadvantage. There has never been another occup occupation that is so saturated with law that is so meticulously legalized, right? Um, I think it was I think it was Sam that mentioned the military orders, right? Military orders are are not just you know um, the an order to to demolish a particular house on a particular day. That might be something that some of us are familiar with. There are thousands and thousands of military orders that that have that essentially create legislation in the in the West Bank. Um, and, and prior to 2005, uh, that was the case in Gaza. And those military orders uh, end up doing exactly what international humanitarian law says not to do under an occupation, which is not to, uh, which is not to change the laws in place and not to make changes to the territory unless otherwise, unless absolutely prevented, right? So unless there's some kind of extreme need to do that, either to protect the, the occupying powers, you know, sovereign territory um, or, to, or for, for military needs or for the interests of the local population, the protected population. That should be those who are under occupation. And yet Israel likes to adopt and, and kind of has over the, over the years through, through court cases um, through the state attorney's office, kind of massaging words such that it, the term protected population eventually was converted into local population, which meant that it could include the settler population. And thus things could be done by the military commander, military orders could be issued, for instance, to declare land uh, zoned for settlement construction, right? For the interests of the local population, which now, right, would include everybody living there. So there are all of these ways in which the law um, is twisted and, and abused um, and essentially um, both used to justify, right? So on the flip side, when, when um, Israel is called upon to, um, to create plans for new neighborhoods in the West Bank, uh, for instance, um, to allow for natural population growth among the Palestinian population, it says, but no, international law says we can't, can't do that. We can't, we can't create new laws. We can't change the territory. That's not for us to do. So, it, you know, it's it's invoking that that kind of freeze um, obligation of, of of international humanitarian law of occupation law, and then, and yet, like I said before, when it comes to developing. Um, for in order to expand settlements, then suddenly 
the, a different justification is used. This is for the benefit of the local population, or this is the previous law. This is the Ottoman law or the British law or the Jordanian law, and we're implementing it. So these are, you know, there is no shortage of examples of how, of how the law is abused in this context. Um, and I think, um, I think that it's in some ways it makes it a dangerous thing um, and I, I, I don't disagree with you, uh, Sam. I think you and I should get coffee and we'll talk for hours. Um, but I, I think sometimes it's a dangerous thing to say, just look at the law because it can come back to, to hurt us in the end as well. All of that said, all of that said, and I know we're very much over time now, I wanna leave us with two kind of, uh, I hope optimistic um, thoughts. So. One is the International Criminal Court, not without, not without um, so many of the flaws right, that, that the international legal system has. Um, lots of questions about, about how it was created, about the fact that all of the convictions so far within the court have been of African nationals. right? So we talked before about the sort of dom dominance of the global north over the global south, whereas the court sits in The Hague in the Netherlands. Um, however, you know, th this is just sort of the tip of the iceberg. However, um, in February, the pretrial chamber of the International Criminal Court, the ICC, um, decided when the Office of the Prosecutor uh, came and said, I have done a five year preliminary examination of the situation in Palestine, looking into uh, both Israeli and uh, Palestinian. Um, war crimes, um, and I want to open an official investigation now, full investigation, because I see that there is a reasonable basis to believe that there were war crimes committed by um, actors on both sides, in particular looking at the settlements, looking at the assaults on Gaza, um, and, looking, and looking also at Hamas um, uh, attacks on, on Israeli civilians. Um, and she said to the court, I want to know whether this court is going to assert jurisdiction over Palestine, right, over this case, because there is a question about whether there is a state of Palestine and about whether the court is going to, about whether there's a, there are borders that can be agreed upon of what is the state. And um, the court made a decision that has been criticized left and right from left and right. Um, but essentially, in my view, made a decision that is a decolonialist decision because it upheld the idea that it said, we don't have to decide whether Palestine is a state under international law. We don't have to decide whether it meets the Montevideo principles or other principles that have emerged since. What we need to decide is whether it joined the court properly and whether there is sufficient evidence of what, its, of what its borders are intended to be for the purposes of the court and its jurisdiction. And what it said by that essentially was, right, and it's like, you know, dozens and dozens of pages. So in one sentence, what it said, in my view, um, by doing that was, we are not going to create a situation in which a state or a people under occupation cannot assert their right uh, to be protected from or for there to be accountability for international crimes that are committed against them on their territory. If it had decided otherwise, then we would be in a world in which states dominate and peoples who have the right to self-determination but who, who, who can't meet the state criteria would not have an avenue or a remedy. Um, and, the, and the ICC decided not to make that um, decision. And I think that it's profound for that reason. Secondly, there are corporate actors who are complicit um, all over this uh, conflict. There are obviously weapons manufacturers um, technology and surveillance um, companies that are that are involved uh, when it comes to to Gaza. Um, there are construction companies 
Um, there are uh, extraction um, companies and heavy manufacturing um, companies that are providing equipment that are taking um, natural resources um, and that are building settlements. And they're doing it with impunity. However, there is a rising trend um, to hold corporations accountable, uh, both civilly and criminally around the world. Um, these companies, a lot of them are foreign companies. What they are doing is illegal in their own jurisdictions. Um, and there is a promising avenue right now um, that it has opened up for holding these corporate actors accountable under their own uh, country's laws um, and creating a wave of accountability and deterrence that could actually make uh, structural change um, and be nothing less than a game changer on the ground that could, um, could make the settlement industry, for instance, an illegal industry. And I believe that uh, it's something that that holds promise and that we should uh, that we should take forward. So thank you very much for bearing with me. <laughs> I'll stop here. Thank you so, 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 so much, Emily. And I acknowledge now that it is well into your nighttime there. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to thank you all so much for taking the time um, I also just want to thank the Human Rights Center and the University of Dayton for providing this platform to engage in this really important conversation. Um, and yeah, again, I just wanted to want to thank the, um, the panelists here. You provided such an invaluable resource for our students and for our community um, to um, better understand um, what has happened now and throughout history um, and sort of to provide a uh, pathway moving forward. Um, I don't know, Shelly, if you would like to say a word. <laughs> um, Shelly is the executive director of our Human Rights Center, not to take up any more of anyone's time, but I would just turn it over to her for a moment. Yeah, just briefly to thank you, Kayla, for putting this together and your family and husband for helping. And I know it's been a full family event and really, how powerful uh, this has been as a, a really meaningful and insightful discussion. We're recording it, we will promote it, and we can't thank you enough for taking your time. Um, we've learned a lot. It's been a very profound experience and um, we appreciate how much new there is and the dynamism that is going on around the Israel-Palestinian issue and that there is um, hopefully spaces in which um, and movements and identities and um, orientations in which we can work as advocates uh, toward a better outcome um, and a better uh, life for everyone uh, who lives um, in this space and for also uh, more accountability overall uh, under international law and maybe under developments um, that, that we can push beyond international law. Um, so thank you guys so much. And uh, I hope we can stay in touch with you all as you move forward. And if there's anything we can do, uh, please let us know. All right, goodbye everybody. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend.